Hey everybody, welcome to Crowd Surfing. Today is November 7th, 2018. Uh, where we normally do this every other week. We missed a week last week just because of post S and stuff, but we are back and oh my goodness, there is a lot of Kickstarter stuff to talk about. I mean, like a lot. For those of you who back all the big projects, you all gotta be broke right now. Well, that being said, this is a show where we talk about Kickstarter and different things like that. We've got a couple contributors here to join me. But as always, we start with the news. All right, so first of all, let's take a look, and there's a lot of projects, I think we have 32 we're taking a look at today. So we're gonna start here with Extraordinary Adventures Pirates. This one I'm talking about specifically because we just did mention this one. Uh, we played this one live yesterday, actually. This is from Forbidden uh, Games. It is kind of a race. You're going down three different tracks here. Uh, zooming down these tracks, trying to pick up goods and turn them in for victory points. A little bit of a deck builder too, and some absolutely fantastic artwork. If you do the highest level, you get these miniatures, which I think would help the game be uh, really cool. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to trying this one out. Uh, this is definitely one of those games that I think I would play with, with all sorts of folks. So that's Extraordinary Adventures, Pirates. And uh, all right. Not sure how, okay. Next is Heck, a tiny card game. Yay, this seems kind of a, a weird, strange one here. Um, it's a card game designer, Jason Anarchy, I guess is his name, and the artwork is from Tiny Snack Comments, Comics. So you put out these three creature things, everyone gets a snake card. That snake card is gonna tell you a little bit about how you bid, and then it has a Heck deck Every heck card has a different heck effect. That doesn't even make any sense. Heck isn't a change from hecked, so effect from effect, I, I'm confused. Anyhow, it looks like this one's gonna be based on the artwork and ha ha ha, oh, nonsense word. Blap smart boopo flurf. All right, so yeah, I don't know that this one really intrigues me, but definitely it's one that a lot of people are interested in. All right, next one is an Anomaly, Find It Before It Finds You. Yeah. Okay, that sounds kind of spooky here. This artwork almost makes me look, uh, it's uh, from Starling Games. This artwork almost looks like the Lost game where people get lost. Starling Games, uh, they've done Black, Black Orchestra, Fear Nothing. Uh, they're the folks basically, uh, they're Game Salute, uh, redone. So here it's a game of hidden movement, deduction, and combat for two to four players. I like the theming of it. I like how the game looks here. I'm actually not sure who the designer is, but it's just very straight up a $40 game. That's it, that's the only stretch goal. All right, so let's see here. Sorry, we're having some uh, problems with the computer here. It's not letting me switch very easily between tabs. So I think I'm gonna have to stay on the small screen here and just build this so that it fills up the whole computer. There we go, one moment, folks. There we go, all right. So jumping off Anomaly, we now have Cloud Spire. Look how much money this one is making, $480,000. That is a whole lot of money. That's because this here is from Josh and Adam Carlson. You might wonder who are they? Well, look at this. Hoppelmachus, and of course, Too Many Bones. Too Many Bones is doing really well. These guys apparently own a poker chip company because that's what this game is too. It looks more like an adventure game and you have poker chip things running around on the map. Again, creatures with stats on them. And so they proved themselves with Too Many Bones, obviously a very popular game. With Custom Dice, this one looks like the same thing, but adventure, I really like how these tiles look here. So that's pretty cool looking. The, the artwork looks good. I don't know that I want to play everything with poker chips, like I kind of do like miniatures, but that's still kind of neat. And obviously who cares what I think because this one is making a, it's gonna make half a million. Well, maybe, there's 31 hours to go. Now we have Dreams of Tomorrow. This is from Weird Giraffe Games. They did Stellar Leap, which I just reviewed a bit ago. Fire in the Library, which is a terrible thing to happen. So Dreams of Tomorrow 
Here, I like the theming of this one. It's a competitive set collection game about weaving dreams. So there's a lot of games about dreams that are out there, really. But they, this one looks interesting. Um, it's getting... I, I like these tarot-sized dream cards. They look really cool. Here's fragments of consciousness, figures and cubes. Well, there's always cubes in these styles games. I'm hoping this one's good. I like the idea of this one a lot. All right, Title Blades Heroes of the Reef. I'm pretty sure we talked about this last time. I can't remember, but we did do a playthrough of this one. This one has broken half a million dollars. And this one, they just keep making it bigger and cooler and more exciting. There's fight. I, I really like this one. I really like the custom dice. I really liked playing this one, uh, upgrading dice and going out and fighting in combat. It looks really neat, and so I highly recommend this one because I played it. Santa Maria American Kingdoms. Now, this is kind of a weird one for me because this one here, this expansion, I know I saw this at Essen. But here it is on a Kickstarter anyway. Three days to go and 610 people are backing it. So it looks like you get an extra deck of cards here, this exploration deck that you will get besides the expansion. So you can back just that deck rather than get the expansion. But again, it's just kind of a weird thing that they were selling this at Essen while it's on Kickstarter. But there you go. Uh, let's see. Next is Project Elite. This is my pick of the week. I love Project Elite. I cannot emphasize much how much I like this game. We had a blast playing this one live, especially our second game, which we did much better than our first game. But just this whole going through and shooting aliens and rolling dice and doing them as fast as you can, that is just... I, I don't know what it is. Real-time game, going through and just, it's, it's so tense and you pause and you watch the aliens come in. It is so much fun. The, my biggest problem with this game was that the miniatures are pretty bad, but Simon now is doing it. This Kickstarter and their miniatures look pretty good. So lots of cool stretch goals, I guess, with aliens and things. Very much looking forward to this one. I love this game. Chartered the Golden Age. This is their second Kickstarter. The first one was also Chartered the Golden Age, which was uh, did not work. So this one has this fascinating thing here of this guy here who's smiling with a mustache. And oh my goodness, it looks like your typical Euro game. But I do like this. Look at these buildings on these rows here. That's kind of a neat thing here. As I look at this, this harbor type thing, that looks a lot of fun. The cards themselves are not as interesting, but those buildings on the cards and placing them there, it just gives this game kind of a, a, a cooler look to it. And it's been funded, so we'll see it as it comes out. Next, Barrage. Now, I'm very excited about Barrage. This is the first one from Cranial Creations. You can see this one's almost up to 300,000. But this is from Tommaso Battista and Simone Luciani. Simone Luciani, one of the hottest designers out there right now. Only six days to go in this one. They told me this was one of their most complicated games. Uh, if you like uh, Lorenzo and Magnifico, which I do a lot, they said this one had some similarities to that and a lot going on in this game. So people like that. I don't think anyone cares about what the theme is. Cranial Creations puts out some really cool games. They got some cool components here. Um, this is one I'm looking forward to playing. A lot of people were playing this one at uh, Essen. They were, they were demoing it there. From the Earth, RPG Fantasy Coins and Currency. I always like to take a look at new metal coins. Let's examine these. Eh, they're okay. No numbers on them. I kind of like coins with a hole in them, but these, I don't know. I got to say, these look like some sort of lost RPG coin, but they don't look like they're necessarily any better than any other coins that are out in the market right now. If I saw these, I'd go, oh, that's neat, and then I'd probably promptly forget about them. Processing, a game of serving humanity. All right, apparently, to serve humans does not mean to work for them. It also does not mean to eat them, as the Twilight Zone thing. Uh, it means to give them papers that tells them they need to show in court. You've been served, I think. That's what's going on here. I don't know. I, I, I feel the funny thing here. You are, you are people forced into employment by alien invaders. Sort out Earth's remaining survivors. Determine who gets freed, who gets probed for science. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a funny theme, but the question is, is it any good? Uh, the D6 generation declares this game a real winner. What's wrong with those guys? 
oh, I actually have a, a long list of what's wrong with those guys, but that's probably not why we're here today. So there's some acrylic tokens. I like to see more acrylic tokens in games. I think that's kind of a cool upgrade thing. So we'll have to see. I know that the theme is kind of silly. This is from Sepi Yoon. What's the other game that they've done? End of the line. I don't think I've played that one. All right, we'll see. Socks of Speed and Socks of Elvenkind. Um, this is not a game. I just put this on here because I like socks. And these are socks that make your feet look like they're wearing sandals and stuff. This is really dumb. I'm, I might back it. I, I don't recommend anyone back this. Oh, I want it. Those are really cool looking. You don't have to wear shoes because you're wearing sandals. Okay, that's kind of dorky. But, all right, let's move on. Skulk Hollow, an asymmetrical two-player game with epic meeples. This one's doing really well. Eduardo Baraf's games normally do. He has done a whole lot of different games. I have been all over the place with his games. Uh, Z tends to like his games more than I do. But, I mean, they are. there's one thing you can say about his games. They are beautiful. They are gorgeous. They always are. This one is no different than the rest. So there's... This ancient woodland is growing, the guardians arise, they're dark guardians, and so there's tactical combats where you're going to make a, a band of heroes and try to stop the guardians. I like that. That's kind of an interesting uh, back and forth, and the artwork and the components for this look fantastic as always. I especially like the guardians. Those things look cool. Those might be bad. They look kind of like good guys. I don't know. All Manner of Evil, or All Manner of Evil, I don't know. This is from Colossal. Uh, this one here is, oh, look at that guy. That looks like H.P. Lovecraft. Is it H.P. Lovecraft? Maybe it is. So enter the manor. This takes place inside his mind. That sounds entertaining. Uh, his mind seems crazy. So you're working there, and it's, it's actually a fairly inexpensive game here. There's double-sided Elder God cards, I guess. Yeah, Cthulhu, Azathoth, roll cards. So going inside the mind of Lovecraft and going into madness, Lovecrafting theme has been done to death, right? Is this different enough? Well, we'll have to wait and see. I'm not sure. This game looks almost a little bit too dark for me, but maybe I'll like it. Half Seas Dice, the Christmas edition. I'm a big fan of half these dice that are half one color and half the other, and here we got ones that are Christmas colored. Now, Christmas coloring means nothing if they're not good dice, but these red and green ones look like they're not too hard to read. The angels are rolling them. The green-white ones are cool. I think I like the red-green ones better. All right, I'd get them. Claustrophobia 1643. This is an updated, improved reissue, it says, of the classic Claustrophobia, where a bunch of guys are going to go down and fight a pile of demons. It's a one versus one game. There is only 10,000 copies, as you can see. It has been up less than a day as of me recording this, and there are already almost 7,000 backers. One thing I find fascinating here is that there are more backers in Europe than there are in America. Not that I I just thought that this would be more of a game that people like in America. But there's uh, 2,580 American backers and 3,814 Europe. And all the Australian and the Asian back ones are gone. But you can see lots of cool miniatures. This is a game that Z likes quite a bit. And there's cool dice. I, I, I played the original version of this, which looked pretty nice. But this one looks a lot better. Nice might be too strong of a word. Spirit Island Jagged Earth, a major expansion to the award-winning cooperative settler destruction strategy game. Yeah, a lot of people are pumped about this. Spirit Island is one of those games that people like and like and like, and it's doing better and better and better. So there's new island boards here. There's eight new spirit panels and a fifth and sixth player token. No way, no way, no way, no way, no way, no way. Vassal's second law of gaming says that if an expansion adds extra players, you should never play with those extra players. Stick with the original count. Exception, Cosmic Encounter. That's it. So anytime, anyway, I don't know that I'd want to play this game with five or six players, but maybe you can use different colors, I guess. But there are a lot of different stretch goals. I'm very intrigued because of the new spirits. Let's see, what do we got here? Volcano, Grinning Trickster Stirs of Trouble, Vengeance, A Burning Plague, kind of burning plague. All right. Lure of the Deep Wilderness, Shroud of the Silent Mist, Fractured Days, Split the Sky, Shifting Memory of Ages, and Stones, Unyielding Defiance. I want to be this burning plague dude. Or the Grinning Trickster. Or the Volcano. I like all those. Oh, and then there's some extra ones. Starlight and Many Minds Move as One. I don't know what that means, but that's cool. If you've never played Spirit Island, it's one of the most complicated uh, cooperative games there is, but it's a very good one. 
All right. Oh, someone just mentioned on in the, the chat that the fulfillment time is ridiculous. Do they mean ridiculously fast or ridiculously slow? Let's see what it says. May 2020? Woo! Woo! That is a long time. Okay. Well, at least they're being honest, right? Just buy it and get it later. All right, Meeples Together, how and why cooperative board games work. This is written by uh, Shannon Applecline, who's a very good uh, board game designer. So he's talking about how cooperative games work. I don't think this cover is doing the game any favors here. That cover looks okay. And I don't know that I would call it Meeples Together either, just because of Meeples. But it's for gamers. It's for critics. The gaming community has an embarrassment of riches when it comes to writers, reviewers, podcasters, and pundits. This book moves the state of the art forward in terms of understanding this key subset of tabletop gaming, making it required reading for anyone with a serious critical interest in tabletop games. Ooh. They're saying I have to read it. Alrighty. Well, cool. I don't know. I'll probably read it. I like reading books, so it's a cooperative one. It's doing okay. 13,000. That's 586 books. That's a lot of books. Bios Origin 2nd Edition, Pax Transhumanity, and Pax Porphyriana. This is from Sierra Madre Games, who make the most complicated Euro games in the world. I, maybe that's not right, but it's close to it. 10,000 gold, and they made 180,000. So their games have a very strong science-slash-history flair to them. You can see that they don't necessarily look gorgeous, the games, but they definitely look like they're full of stuff. Look at all that. This double sided map board, brain maps challenge cards there's a lot going on i've actually played one sierra madre game in my life and it was very complex and interesting but i don't know how many of those i would want to do valhalla card dice game for one to six players i know a lot of people got this i know sam got a copy of this we don't normally review kickstarter games till after the kickstarter is over but hey lots of dice this is vikings you know sam's going to be excited about that ragnarok Custom dice. Uh, looks like a lot of other Ragnarok games. All right, moving on. Welcome to a second printing and new neighborhood expansions. This one has 120,000. You know, there's always a genre that's very crowded. So this year, the genre that's crowded is roll and write games. So, hey, this one is the one that seems to be standing above the rest. Oddly enough, I have not played it, although I had an offer to play it last night, but I was doing something else. Lots of things. There's new neighborhoods in this one. More cards. A candy machine. Spooky town. Trick or treat. Ooh, I like that. I want to play with that expansion in a spooky neighborhood. Outbreak. I don't know if I want to play a zombie version of it. But all right. But if you want these or if you've never played the game before, here's your chance to get on board. Mutants, an innovative asymmetric deck builder. All right, this is from Lucky Duck Games. Lucky Duck Games make me very happy. They've done Vikings Gone Wild. And... They've done Chronicles of Crime, which, if you've never heard of it, is an amazing game. This one looks kind of cool. It has a bunch of cards, different colors. If there's one thing Lucky Duck knows how to do, it's how to make a game look fantastic. Bring your own unique mix of mutants to the battle. I like the artwork here. This is certainly one I want to give a whirl to. Deep Madness, second printing. This one just crossed a half million dollars. Uh... Z has the first edition of Deep Madness, so it looks like this crazy, you know, it's, again, it's one of these games where it looks kind of like XCOM, right? That's what this Deep Madness looks like. That has, yet again, gross-looking monsters. How many games have these monsters now? I mean, I, there's nothing wrong with it, I guess. Uh, look at their names. Blind, Delirium, Husk, Agony, Hysteria, Ravenous, Mind Eater. Yay! Uh, does anyone ever make monsters that look cool and not just like gross walking arm things? But anyway, this game is certainly getting a lot of buzz. Reavers of Midgard, the sequel to Champions of Midgard. This one's almost to a quarter million from Gray Fox Game. Champions of Midgard is a fantastic game, of course. This one here is the next standalone game in this universe. Which, once again, I like to point out that the Champions of Midgard universe seems like it's just Earth. I always think it's weird when people have a universe that's on Earth. But anyway, with trolls and stuff. It looks cool. I don't know. There's Raven dice, Yggdrasil dice, Berserker dice. I mean, there's lots of cool components. I was told I would really like this game. But lots of publishers tell me I would like their games. But I am certainly intrigued with this one and can't wait to give it a whirl. 
All right, Street Masters Aftershock. So Street Masters, which is uh, basically Double Dragon, the board game, this one here. I interviewed the designers for this, and so they talked about it. Did you see this mega box? This thing is humongous. It's a cube. With, and it's going to store everything, I think, from the first game and the second one, so there's more people here. Essence of Evil, I can smell it now. So if you like Double Dragon, I mean, look at all these miniatures, and you just want to go around and fight. These are the miniatures I can get into. Look, a bear. Oh, I like that bear. All right. Sword and Sorcery, Ancient Chronicles, another quarter million. There is so much money for games and Kickstarter right now. This one here from Ares Games. This is a fully cooperative fantasy board game, and I think this is a standalone expansion. Sam likes Sword and Sorcery a lot. I have not played it. This cover just looks old. It looks like a 1990s cover. It's not selling me on the game at all. But I do know that there's lots of miniatures in this game. They look kind of cool. I heard it's a good dungeon crawl type game, so there you have it. Catacombs, third edition. This one here is constantly moving up. It will probably pass its goal soon. This is I Love Catacombs, a third edition of this with play mats instead of boards. I wonder how they're cutting the holes in these play mats. Huh. And manuals and wall stands and wood pieces. Yeah, I love that. If you notice, there's a seal of excellence here. Uh, I think Catacombs is a great game. This is the way it was meant to be played, which apparently means I've been playing it wrong for the past several years, but I do like it a lot. And their catacombs, I have used some of their mats before in some of the other games, so this will be cool to see these catacombs pieces used. If you haven't seen this, it's a flicking dungeon game where one person's a dungeon master, everyone else is a dungeon party. You go through and you flick enemies at each other, and that sounds silly, but it works really well. Bugman Battle, an edible party game. This one's on the list because it's ridiculous. All right, this is a party game. There's interaction between players. And apparently it comes with one chili hot pot silkworm pupas, one seawood bamboo worms, one barbecue cumin grasshoppers. And if you do things in this game, you have to eat some of those. It looks like a silly party game, like selfie time. Set a 10 second camera timer with your phone. Fight your place in the photo. The team that has most of the frame with a clear face wins. The losing team needs to eat a bug. I'd like to clarify, I will never play this game. Because I don't want to eat bugs. And I don't want to fight to get myself in a selfie either. Uh, I just put this one on the list because it's different. All right. Just two more games here. Zero Gravity, the first 3D magnetic miniatures game, which this is not the first time this has been on Kickstarter. Let's see. It was on Kickstarter. It got 125 funded and 244 or 50%. I don't know why. It just hasn't... Fund it well in the past. Now it funded it in four hours, it says. This one is definitely a gimmick, right? I could put this board straight out and everything, but just moving around on this magnetic board does seem really cool. This seems like something that I would want to play. So there you have it. And finally, Monumental. This is the second time Monumental has been made by Fun Forge. This game with miniatures here. We got King Arthur, Cerberus, a Minotaur, Imhotep, Albert Einstein, Sphinx, and Cleopatra versus William Shakespeare, a genie, and Goriol. I don't know what any of that means, but it sounds really cool. And this game has been getting a lot of buzz. I know they had it at um, uh, Essen. Look at all those miniatures, all that stuff. And of course, Fun Forge makes a lot of really good games. The miniatures in this look really good. There's a lot of content here. And so this one's doing really well. How high did this one get right now? I think it's at a quarter million. Oh, 360,000. That's pretty good. Whew, that is a lot of Kickstarters. There is a lot of stuff going on. Oh my goodness. As always, you might say, why didn't he look at this? Because I only look at stuff that's ending in the next two weeks normally. So in two weeks, I'll talk about some more stuff. Anyway, let's move on. Hey folks, and welcome to another FOMO, the segment where I take a look at a game that is seeking crowdfunding right now that maybe I have a fear of missing out on, maybe not, and maybe you're in the same boat. Today, we're going to take a look at a game together. We're going to take a look at All Manner of Evil. All Manner of Evil is a game for one to six players. Yes, this game plays solo, where players are thieves who have broken into the manner of HP Lovecraft. You'll be stealing relics, but be aware these relics have the power to drive you mad and possibly awaken ancient forces. Players will start by selecting an action card from their hand simultaneously, and then all players will reveal that action card. These will resolve based on the number on them, 
but players who have selected the same action will take a madness token and their resolution determined from the player who currently holds the lantern. In order, players will resolve the action on their chosen card and then they must steal a relic from one of the rooms listed on their card if they're able. Relics stolen resolve any printed abilities and are placed on top of the player's cache. In addition, the card will add awakening tokens to gods and possibly cause the player to gain or lose madness. Note that relics that are taken by any other means besides steel do not trigger their abilities. Once all players have resolved their action card for the round, check for end of game conditions, and if not met, then a new round starts. In the next round, the action card selected the previous round will not be available to the player. Pass the lantern to the next player in clockwise order, refill the room to the house, and begin again. The game can end in one of three ways. If more than one god is awakened, one god is awakened, or the second clock card from the manor deck is revealed. A god is awakened if it has six or more awakening tokens on it. If more than one god is awakened during a round, doom falls upon the land and all players lose. If at the end of a round one god is awakened, then any effects of the god are resolved and final scoring takes place. If the second clock is revealed at any point during a round, the game ends immediately and final scoring occurs. For the end of the game, when the players have not all lost, the order is resolved by revealing their hidden roll cards and resolving the printed effect. Resolve the effects of the Awakened God card if applicable, and add the printed madness values of all the player's relics cards to each player. The player with the most madness at this point is devoured and has lost. The player's remaining total money from their relics and their roll card scoring, and the player with the most money is the winner. In the event of a tie, the player with the least madness wins. So that's a brief look at all manner of evil. Now I do want to thank Colossal for sending this prototype over so we could take a look at it. So that is a prototype copy. Now as to the game itself, I was really surprised how much I enjoyed this. I knew the theme was going to be interesting to me. This whole idea of sneaking into HP Lovecraft's house, stealing relics, that seemed cool. And the idea that these relics are going to drive me mad and potentially awaken gods. That is really cool to me. But what I didn't expect is that how much I really enjoyed the action selection in this game and the fact that you're playing your opponents more than anything. Not only do you have to decide what you think they're going to select because you don't want to select the same card as another opponent if possible, you also need to think about what rooms they may be trying to get a relic out of and which relics are going to be better overall. Less madness, more money. And you want to think about those hidden roles. What do you think they're working towards? Words. Are they trying to awaken a god? Or are they trying not to? Because those those relics and abilities allow you to remove and manipulate things. And you could force them to draw from the manor deck and maybe take cards they don't want. So there's this huge social aspect to the game that I really enjoyed and the hidden roles really adds to it. If I had one knock on the game, it's the artwork was a little underwhelming for me. It's good for what it is. I It's functional graphic design. It just, the artwork felt a little muddy. I'm not, it's not enough to make me not want to play the game, but I would have maybe have liked to have seen something with a little more pizzazz to it. Anyway, this is going to be my FOMO scores for the game. You can see that I really did enjoy this one. If it's something that you think that you might enjoy or your game group, go ahead and check out their crowdfunding page. And I look forward to seeing you folks next episode. Okay, so we have been talking about some of these projects here. Let's take a look here at uh, Claustrophobia 1643. All right, so Claustrophobia 1643, this went up yesterday, and this has been going gangbusters. But if you notice here, the goal for Claustrophobia is $79. That is correct. The goal for this is one copy of the game. And in fact, if we look here at the updates for this, fastest funding ever, they say here, so they said, Claustrophobia is now the fastest funding Kickstarter campaign ever. And uh, then they do a bunch of hell, hell uh, puns and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, sure. Now, look, I, I'm not getting all over uh, the company for, for doing this sort of thing. I, Monolith can do what they want. I backed the game. Because I want to put a copy in the Dice Tower libraries for people to play. And it looks really cool or not. But then I was looking at the other ones and I saw the, you know, the expansion that is actually existing right now. And we're seeing this sort of thing. You know what? This, 
I, I really think we need to call Kickstarter as a company out now. We need to stop pretending that Kickstarter is anything other than a store. Now, don't get me wrong, you can still fund projects and Kickstarter is still a way for a company to go out and you know do something. If you have an idea for a game and you want to launch it, or if you have an idea for a podcast like we do, or what have you, and oh, here's our next one, we need money for it, it still works that way, right? But there are companies now who are blatantly, like claustrophobia, the 10,000 copies of this game are already printed. They don't need the money to print them. They're already printed. They are literally selling 10,000 copies on Kickstarter. They know it. We know it. You know it. Kickstarter knows it. And yet the Kickstarter still has the gumption to go, we're not a store. You're a store. All right. I don't mind that, okay? Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not upset about that. I, I don't mind that Eagle and um, Queen already have their games printed and go on there and pre-sell them or that companies go on there like CMON does because they really don't, you know, they don't necessarily need to. They got the funding that they can do to put out these games, but it's a good source of income and it also gets a lot of buzz going for the games and Kickstarter doesn't care because they're getting their 15%. But we need to stop pretending that Kickstarter is some wonderful magical place that is helping people it is helping people and it definitely has pushed forward board gaming but it's definitely morphing now to the point when companies do stuff like this everyone's kind of like oh yeah okay and a few people get upset and i don't see any reason to get upset about it but it's just it's just ridiculous at this point that 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 again we can sit there and pretend that it's something that it's not i don't mind you know i it's fun. I can go to Kickstarter and go shopping for games. I don't mind that these games will never go to retail. That's what Monolith's doing now. They did it with Batman. They're doing it with Claustrophobia. They're going straight from them to the consumer. That's fine by me. It makes the company money. The consumer gets the games they want. Yeah, they cut out the middlemen. Distributors and stores aren't going to get them. Yeah, that's unfortunate for those people, but they weren't necessary, right? It's going to the, the game. That's just how life is going to be. And not every game is going to follow that path. Just some games are. I just think that maybe we can stop the whole song and dance act about, oh, we need Kickstarter. No, you don't. You put a $79 goal. I'll fund your entire campaign by myself. Thank you. Yeah. Anyway, it's just kind of a ridiculous thing. So, yeah, someone here in the, in the chat says, Kickstarter is a store for board games for every other product that's not. Well, that's probably true, I guess. But there's lots of other things I back, too. There's lots of other projects that I back and I basically just bought something. I know it's not for video games because if you back a video game on Kickstarter, your chance of getting it's like, I think, what, less than 50% at this point? So you're basically just throwing money in the garbage. I think I've backed one or two video games at this point. I don't think I've gotten either one of them so far. Um, and then this person says, we need to focus and support the smaller publishers and not throw our money at the biggest ones. That's baloney, with all due respect. But why? Why should I give my money to small publishers over a large one? because they need it more. I'm giving my money to the company that makes me the coolest game, the games I want to play. So, anyhow, I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. I just, this, this kind of just triggered me a little bit when I saw it the other day. I was like, oh yeah, no, no, no. Come on now. Again, no problem with Monolith, no problem with Simon, Eagle Queen, all these people who are doing the system. If I have any problem, it's with Kickstarter pretending that this isn't happening when it very clearly is. All right, I just thought it was interesting. Um, are you allowed to crow that you won a race if you decide the finish line is an inch away? <laughs> I won! Again! Come here, four-year-old son. I won arm wrestling! Again! Alrighty, but there you go. Alrighty, that's what I think. Let's talk to someone who is much more nuanced than I am. This is Jamie with Stonemaier Games, and today I'm going to talk about leadership as it pertains to Kickstarter. If you are a Kickstarter creator, whether or not you want to be a leader or not, you are actually leading your backers from the inception of the product all the way through the delivery and beyond. You are a leader, and your effectiveness as a leader can impact the number of backers you draw in, the number of existing backers you engage, and if you're a bad leader, you might turn off some of those backers and you'll, you might lose some backers. So I have three different categories with one specific example each that you should or shouldn't do, in my opinion, um, in vision, passion, and trust. For vision, I 
highly recommend that you explain through visuals and text on your project page why you've made the decisions you have for the product itself, for the game itself. This will help with the many different conversations that will happen with backers where they're asking you to add different things that might go against that vision. You can help avoid some of those conversations and spend your time more effectively by explaining that why. For example, you might have backers saying, why don't we add more combat to this game? Why don't you add a seventh player? Why don't you do this? Why isn't there a solo mode? All these things. And sometimes those questions will make you realize, you know, they actually, that there is actually a reason I could add that. That's in line with my design vision for it. But many other times, you'll be able to point to your design, this, uh, design vision and say, that's actually, that's not what this game is all about. That's not what I'm creating. If you're interested in more combat, here's a game that has more combat. I recommend this for you. Um, for passion, I've seen passion go both ways. I've seen creators use passion in ways that are so over the top that it can actually be a bit of a turnoff. In particular, when, when creators um, apply adjectives to their own project, where they say, this is the most fun game ever. This is the most beautiful game ever. Let backers decide that for themselves. Backers uh, can decide if something is beautiful or fun or not. Um, rather, if you want to explain your passion and joy, talk about it in first person. Say, I'm excited about this game. Tell your story and, and, and how it led you to this game or this project. Um, by making it personal, then that can convey passion in a way that isn't a turnoff. The last category is trust. Um, it's very easy to lose backers' trust. There are tons of ways that you can lose their trust. Um, but there are a few, uh, two quick examples of how you can gain their trust is to share both good and bad news. Don't always be universally positive. Let backers know when you have vulnerable moments in terms of the project, when something doesn't go the way it's planned, when you get a quote back from the manufacturer that doesn't turn out the way that you want it to, or a component that doesn't look the way you wanted it to. You don't have to hide all that stuff. You can share it and be transparent, and by, through that transparency, you'll gain trust. Also, I often used a money-back guarantee on my projects. It was rarely actually used by anyone. I think only 15 people ever in the history of my Kickstarter campaigns out of tens of thousands of backers ever asked for a money back uh, refund after they received their product. Um, but having that on there can inspire a little bit of confidence. You show the backers that you believe in your product so much that you're willing to give them their money back if, if you don't deliver on your promises. That's about trust. Vision, passion, and trust. Many different ways to, do, to execute these categories and become effective leaders. I'd love to hear about your thoughts on how you can be an effective leader on my blog or in the comments below. And uh, good luck being a fantastic leader for your backers. Hey folks, welcome back to the Dice Tower Preview Recap. You know, these previews are paid previews from the publishers. However, it is our hope that we can give you a real flavor of each game. First up, we have Ninja Squad. Ninja Squad is like it sounds, you have a squad of ninjas moving across a village at night cooperatively trying to take out the Shogun that has been terrorizing the villagers for eons or years. And uh, there's light and there's guards, lots of obstacles to avoid. Now, once the Shogun is taken out, the game changes to a competitive game and now it's a race to get out of the city and see which ninja has the most ninja-like skills. Ninja Squad is brought to you by Black Spindle Games. It's for two to four players, ages 10 and up, and games range anywhere from 20 to 45 minutes. Next up, we have Glyph Chess. And like it sounds, it's a kind of a chess variant, except you are one of the most powerful wizards of the land, and only those wizards can play this game. You're gonna be using your different uh, pieces to maneuver across the board in, in an effort to move your scepter to the middle of the board, or be the last scepter standing. You'll be using all kinds of magical abilities. You have necromancers, you have elementalists, and you have force mages, all kinds of powerful creatures in a ways to wage battle with magic. Glyph Chess is brought to you by Blue Viper Studio. It's for two to three players, ages eight and up, and games range anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes. Next up, we have Legendary Adventures Pirates. You take on the role of a captain with three ships on three different sailing tracks, and you're moving across the Caribbean, plundering along the way, getting bigger and better treasure as you plunder across the seas, and ultimately trying to make it to the other side of the map, Trinidad, and get the ultimate treasure. And of course, in the end, whoever has the most victory points is going to be the ultimate pirate of the seas. Legendary Adventures is brought to you by Forbidden Games, and it's for two to five players, ages eight and up, 
and game times range anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes. Next up we have Terminus Breach. Terminus Breach is that classic tower defense style game. Each race is trying to survive as they battle together to stop the incoming horde. Along the way, you're gonna be building war chests and spy networks, and you're going to also be upgrading your towers to be that much more powerful to take out the bigger leveled creatures and the bosses that are gonna come through. Ultimately, it's whoever the top race who gathers the most victory will win the day. Terminus Breach is a self-published title. It's for one to four players, ages 13 and up, and game times range anywhere from 60 to 180 minutes. And lastly, we have Arena Bots. In Arena Bots, you play as a pilot, piloting your robots to victory. However, not only are your robots in the arena, but you are also in the arena, so you have to watch your back at every turn. You're gonna be trying to take over terminals and gather victory points along the way, and ultimately, the last bot standing will be the champion. Arena Bots is from Happy Games Factory. It's for two to four players, ages 10 and up, and game times range anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes. So those are our latest Dice Tower previews. However, let's take a look, a quick glimpse at a couple upcoming previews that I'm excited about. So both of the games we're gonna take a look at here are games that are up on Kickstarter as we speak. First, we have Manor of All Evil from Colossal Games. You and your fellow players will be invading H.P. Lovecraft's home, trying to find artifacts and relics and treasures that are beyond belief. And ultimately, each of you have your own agenda. So this game is pretty interesting, some pretty nice artwork. I'm looking forward to playing some more. And finally, I'm super excited to be taking a look at Claustrophobia 1643 from Monolith Games. And What's so cool is that this is a survival game for two players. One player is the humans who are pretty powerful, really. However, they're pitted against a demonic horde of almost limitless numbers. And the game features tons of scenarios to play through. These amazing dashboards and, of course, miniatures with these big, beautiful tiles that build out the dungeon. Uh, just a fantastic looking game and hugely thematic. I can't wait to dive more into this one. All right, folks. So if any of these games look interesting to you, please go check out our full previews and definitely keep an eye out for these new upcoming ones. So if you want your game featured as a Dice Tower preview, please shoot me an email. And I think that's it for me. And until next time, we'll see you at the table. All right, well, that's pretty much everything in the show today. Like I said, there was a lot of Kickstarters to go over. Before we end, any, any questions here? Thoughts on Guardians of Wayward? Uh, I don't actually know what Guardians of Wayward is. Uh, Guardians of Wayward. Is that on Kickstarter? A dice building game. <laughs> well, that's slow internet. Kid Loves Tiger. 14 days to go. Huh. Yeah, it looks okay. It's, uh... Not a big fan of the artwork here. The artwork's like a little kiddish, maybe? But the dice look cool. So, eh, who knows? Maybe it's good. Thoughts on Awkward Guests! I, th I heard that they uh, launched the, uh... That they launched the... Uh, Kickstarter while I was doing this video so we'll definitely be talking about that next time awkward guests mystery and deduction it was canceled the last time let's see what their new one is here awkward guests who murdered mr. Walton there's a new one huh looks like it funded yay well that's exciting yeah awkward guests is a really really fantastic game and it's a great deduction game Oh, good. I'm glad to see that it's funding well. That pleases me. All right, let's see here. You back claustrophobia? What intrigues you about it? Not a single thing. <laughs> I don't care about claustrophobia one way or the other. I was okay when I played it the first time. I backed it because we want to put it in the Dice Tower library for people to play. Well, I, mean, I cannot tell you guys how great our Dice Tower library is going to be as time goes by. We're making sure that we're hunting down every good game, great game we can think of and sticking it in the library, whether I like it or not.
Um, how's a new Kickstarter for Dice Hour coming along? Well, we're still in a lot of planning stages for it. It's not starting until January, so there's still a lot of stuff to get ready. Are there Kickstarter games that do not belong in Kickstarter? I don't care. I don't care one whit if a game's on Kickstarter or not. I never sit there and go, that game shouldn't be on Kickstarter. Because, first of all, you don't know that a game should be on Kickstarter or not. And secondly, I don't, like I said, Kickstarter doesn't mean anything to me anymore as a, oh, I need your help, I'm on Kickstarter. No, I'm like, oh, do I want the game or not? The needs of the creator do not seem important enough to me as a backer. I'm more looking at, do I want the project? That's just the way it's turned out to be for me. Do I prefer Cryptid or Awkward Guests? I like Awkward Guests better, but Cryptid is a great game. I have not played the new Gloomhaven expansion. Um, are you excited for the Wilson Wolf Affair Kickstarter? Whenever they get that one shipped. Uh, I, I back a Kickstarter and then I forget about them. When I get them, I get them. Uh, what are your thoughts on Nemesis? I looked at it. looks like Aliens, the board game. I'm going to be playing it next Tuesday because there's someone in my game group who's dying to play it. So... I promise to wait for them to try it with them. All righty, well, that's it for some questions. Let's get this ended. We got other videos that just went up. I reviewed the newest Uwe Rosenberg game today. And our next top 10 greatest games of all time is dropping tomorrow, so keep an eye out for that. And we'll be doing a live back talk on Friday. Until next time, though, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Crowdsurfing.